Joe, I just found out as a local guy, St. Albans grad, and a, a double dookie. So you have um, a bachelor's from Duke and an MBA from Fuqua. Joe joined Eloqua five years ago. Six. Oh, six years ago. And you had a nice IPO a few months ago. That's right. Which we want to talk about. And um, prior to joining, um, Joe was the president and CEO of iFence, which was owned by Verisign, and the president and CEO of eSecurity, president and CEO of eGrail, and the CMO at MicroStrategy. You look too young to have done all that. Is that if, possible? If you keep trying, eventually you'll have success. You just got to keep <laughs> trying. <laughs> So Joe has won numerous awards. His bio is the first one in our book here, and we're really pleased to have you. And I guess, why don't we start by talking about your company, Eloqua. Uh, I'm interested in the history of the company. You know, how was it founded? What was the thinking behind it? Any pivots that you had leading up to sort of your first round of funding and then subsequent to there? Sure, Tian, and, and uh, happy to go any direction that you guys want to go this morning and uh, chat about a lot of different topics, given the time. Eloqua was founded in 2000 um, in Toronto, Canada by uh, some young 23-year-olds who had been paying attention to the internet and had realized that the internet was going to change uh, how companies uh, bought products. And so they started what is uh, called marketing automation today in 2000. The company's been doing that ever since. I joined the company at the end of 2006. The company was a $10 million company. Um, it's, a, it's, it's one of those funny stories about where life leads you. Um, the investor asked me to come and do a short-term stint, and I refused because it was in Toronto, Canada in the winter. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to go up to Toronto, Canada in the winter. And then finally, um, he convinced me a month later because I didn't, I didn't have a job. And he said, you don't have a job. You might as well do this. So I, I flew up to Toronto, and I spent what I thought was going to be three months there, and it's six years later. And um, so, you know, sometimes when you're doing that consulting assignment, um, you know, keep your eyes open. You never know what it's going to turn into. What I found was a, a company that was uh, literally revolutionizing, um, you know, the way companies uh, marketed to their customers. And so uh, many of you out there today, I'm looking around, and there's a little bit of gray hair in the room, and, and there's a little bit of no hair in the room, and I'm in that, I'm in that latter category. And, and all of us grew up in a world where uh, businesses, when they sold products and services, they sat down with the customers, they got to explain what their products were, and salespeople uh, you know, were really instrumental in closing business. And what's changed today, and I hope you guys are, are, are realizing it, there's a, there's a few of my clients in the room I know who do, but what's changed is that when a buyer wants to buy something today, when they want to buy payroll services, for example, they don't call your salesperson up and say, come in and educate me. They go to Google, just like you do. And uh, at Google, they Google payroll services companies, and they watch webinars, and they look at videos, and they download white papers, and they read forums. And in that process, they typically eliminate about half the vendors that they, that they, that they uh, are going to look at. And so your company could be eliminated without ev them ever calling you, without ev them ever talking to a salesperson, because they're doing all their research online. And so what Eloqua does is we actually manage uh, that online process and allow the marketing team to maintain a buyer profile. And this is for businesses, mind you. So I'm not talking about consumer stuff maintain that buyer profile, and then push that information over to sales. And so uh, it's a real revolution in what's happening. And so the, so the world's best companies now today, the market leaders across many, many industries, are using these techniques to win their markets. So back to the history, um, I found a sleepy little company run by 23-year-olds, and, and it was really fun. And over the last five years, six years, just brought in a, a senior team. Uh, we've really built the business uh, for the long term. Uh, it's a subscription business, which has a lot of advantages, which, which we can talk about, um, and been fortunate enough to, to, to have some pretty good success. That's great. And who were your initial funders, and how was after you came in, did you raise additional capital? Yeah, that's another thing that's interesting about us as, as a company. So JMI Investments in Baltimore um, what were the investors that I, that I knew that brought me into the company. And they and Bay Partners in San Francisco had led the A and the B round. Um, the B round had closed probably a month before I joined. I, uh, I, I raised a C round, just one round in 2007, um, with Bessemer. 
And so we have Bay, Bessemer, and JMI. And what, one of the things, if you're an entrepreneur in the room, that I would recommend to you, and, and all the venture capitalists are going to cringe when I say this, but raise as little money as possible. Um, the venture guys, it's in their best interest for you to raise as much money as possible because in the end, they end up owning most of the company. But um, one of the things that we did, and it was, it, I'd love to tell you it was because we were smart. It wasn't. It was because the economy changed things in 2000, uh, late 2008, you know? And we ended up uh, laying off 20% uh, of our workforce at the end of 2008 in order to get cash flow positive, in order to control our own destiny. So we didn't raise money until the IPO. We hadn't raised money in five years. And, and that's the best thing that we ever did for our employees, for our current investors, um, and for our management team, because we still own the stakes in the company that we owned five years ago. And when you can maintain that ownership, through IPO, uh, it's, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice event for, for the team. Um, it takes a lot of discipline, and there are many reasons. The, 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 your, your board and your investors will all tell you all the reasons why you should spend more money than you make, but, uh, but I would tell you that for us anyway, it worked out really well to, to not raise money and fall into that trap of you have to raise the next round and the next round and the next round. And so Eloqua has $35 million of capital into it, um, and we're a $100 million uh, co company, um, and it's just the, the, the benefits of that run in, in lots of different directions. So uh, that's something that we're, that we're really proud of. Yeah, it's nice to have $100 million of recurring revenue that's highly profitable, too, right? Which is what I wanted to ask you. How did you grow that? Um, you know, there, you, the universe of SaaS companies that are that size is very small. So what was your, how did you get that kind of traction? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's hard work. I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, Eloqua has been in Washington for five years, and uh, I probably can. Uh, I probably got invited to two speaking engagements over that five years, and I'm doing two today. So what the what the uh, community looks like looks at is is events like the IPO is a big deal. But but you know, we've been plugging away for a long time. Uh, you know, really, it's 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 it sounds trite, but we focus on our customers. And I hire really good people. And I think, I think that's the part that as an executive, um, I made a lot of mistakes as a young executive. And what I learned in the end is if you go out and hire the best people at what they do, um, that's, how, that's how you grow. And you, know, you, you listen to your customers. The other thing I would t tell you as entrepreneurs, um, having a new CEO come in when the company was about 10 million was really helpful in this sense. I didn't have any vested interest in anything, right? And so I was new. And so my first week, all I did was meet with customers. And customers told me exactly what was wrong with our product, exactly what was wrong with our service, exactly what was wrong with our pricing. And I listened because I didn't have any vested interest. And so I was fortunate that I thought I was only going to be there for three months. And so I went and changed everything. I figured I had nothing to lose. So we changed the pricing. We changed how we offered the products. We changed our service model. We brought in a whole bunch of partners. And we did that all in the first three months because I thought I was going to be leaving after three months. And, uh, and it turns out when I stuck around, those were all uh, you know, good, easy decisions. And it wasn't because I was a genius. It was because our customers knew exactly what we needed to do. And we just followed what they said. And it's amazing as an entrepreneur, because I've done this before, is uh, oftentimes as an entrepreneur, we have our vision. And, 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 and people encourage us to have our vision. And, um, and you get wrapped up in your vision, and your vision has little to do with what the customers are doing and what the customers need you to do. And so don't get wrapped up in your vision. Listen to what your customers are doing and saying, and, um, and that's, a great, that's a great path forward. You have to lead your customers a little bit for sure, but, uh, but you know, when they tell you your pricing model is stupid and doesn't work for them, Leave your vision at the door and, and, and change what you're doing. Right, but going from 10 to 100 million in SaaS, and I know there's a lot of guys in the room that are doing SaaS, how do you do that? I mean, I know it's easy to say focus on your customers. and I mean, is it just a big grinding away? Um, do you have concentration with a couple of clients that helped you grow that fast? Or? No, it's, it's, it's a great question, Tien. So no one client represents uh, uh, more than sort of 1.2% of our business. So it's a lot of clients. It's a total land and expand strategy. Um, just to show of hands, how many of you here have been in the software industry before? So almost everybody. Anybody here in the subscription business, a SaaS or any other kind of subscription business? Right, I, I think what's really interesting for me, it, this is my first subscription business, and it really flips on its head how you run the business. In a subscription business, you want to land and expand. You want to get a small deal, get in, you have to prove yourself, 
And if you prove yourself, you get more and more business. Um, we started with American Express in Australia. They paid us $30,000 a year. Little, small, tiny deal. We got them up and running in about four days through a partner, and they started using our product. Seven months later, they were in a meeting in, in London. They told their team in, in American Express London what they were doing. The London team bought them through our London team. Then a year later, they told the New York team. T today, American Express is close to a million dollar a year client for us, but, um, but it didn't start that. We didn't walk into American Express and try to sell them a million dollar deal. We walked in, we sold them a $30,000 deal, and we built on that and built on that and built on that. And, and the same is true at ADP, where we, we serve eight divisions today. We started with one at Walters Kluwer, where we serve eight divisions. We started one Wells Fargo. You know, so, uh, you know, one of the things about the way we've built our business and SaaS companies built theirs is just sell them a little bit, prove it it works, and then sell more. And um, it's a great sales model. And, uh, and long term, you know, what happens is those clients then pay you that as a subscription every year. So once you get the flywheel moving, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great situation. Right, but when you land in American Express or Wells Fargo or someone large, do you have to do a lot of customization? Because part of the beauty of CEOs want to do SaaS companies is because they want that cookie cutter approach. So you have to balance that cookie cutter approach with custom, right? Yeah. We, the one thing I like about Eloqua is I don't think the word customization is in my vocabulary anymore. Um, we don't do customization, right? We do, we do implementation and we do, uh, you know, customer loads content in. So they, they all have their own database. They all have their own programs. They build, build all the things they need in our system, but we don't customize the software. We have one version of the software. It sits on a set of servers, and they access it uh, with a browser. So th this form of delivering software is, is by far the best. I'll, I'll never work in a traditional software company again. I'll always do SaaS just because the, the, the financial model for both the company and the customer is better, and it forces you to be a great customer-oriented company because if you don't make your customers successful, they leave. And so, you know, that's, that's, the, ultimate, uh, that's, you know, that, that's the ultimate test of, what, of what, you, what you're doing. One of the things, Tien, we did, again, if you're a SaaS company in the room, I, I recommend you think about some of these things. Um, we do a money-back guarantee. No software company in the world can do a money-back guarantee. They'd have rev rec issues. But we offer a money-back guarantee. It solves a lot of problems in the contracting process when you basically say, look, you can cancel at any time. You know, we do a three-year price guarantee. We tell the customer right up front. You know, they're like, we don't want our price to go up more than 5% a year. We say, no, no, your price will go up nothing. If you buy the same product next year that you bought this year, it's exactly the same price. What you're banking on with that customer is they're going to buy more. You're going to sell them more products. They're going to buy more capacity, whatever. You're going to buy more. But giving them that certainty on price these are advantages that a subscription company, a SaaS company can do. And, and, and so if you're one of those companies, look at, look at some of the best practices of companies like ours and right now and salesforce.com. We've all figured out a lot of ways that it's, it's easy to beat the incumbent players with these kind of techniques. Um, and it's really good for the customer. Right, let's talk a little bit about your strategic decision to go public. Because you mentioned right now in salesforce.com, I'm sure they, they were knocking on your door. Maybe they still are. but. Um, you know, what was the decision calculus behind doing that? Why did you do it? Why did you go through it? You know, what was the thinking behind the use of funds, et cetera? Yeah. <clears throat> for, for Eloqua, you know, uh, one thing that I've worked really hard to, to make true is that going public was a financing event. You know, it wasn't the be all end all for the company. You know, we, wo we woke up on August 3rd and we still had a thousand customers to serve and we still you know, had a system that was managing, we managed 10 billion transactions every day on our platform. So um, none of that changed on August 3rd. We went public on, on August 2nd. So we tried to v focus the company on this is just a financing event. Um, why do we, you know, why do we do it? Um, I sometimes ask myself that uh, when, I, when I go to an investor conference. Um, but it's interesting, uh, the, the, the short glib answer is we did it to raise money. We, um, we ran cash flow break even for five years. Um, this is a true story, I, I don't think I've told it publicly, so uh, this year the first to know. Um, the day before uh, we went public, I got my weekly, I got my weekly uh, metrics report from the FP&A team, and it said uh, cash on hand, $200,000. We, we have a company that's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, spending 
90 million dollars this year, 90 plus million dollars this year, a payroll of 405 people, we had $200,000 in the bank. And, um, and I went to my CFO who was with me because we're on the road for the IPO and I said, hey, I think they made a typo in the, uh, in the thing. You know, we, we've always had about We've had always around seven to $10 million in the bank. It was getting a little tight. We had a lawsuit. We had to settle the dang lawsuit. Um, so we had to do a payout right before we went public. You know, um, we, were, we were, you know, on the road and 200, he said, no, no, that's what we have in the bank. And, uh, and we had just funded payroll, so we were good for a few weeks. And, um, but, you know, if this IPO doesn't happen, um, we're in trouble. And so. I did some really good one-on-ones right after that. I was at my, I was most focused. And so, uh, it, it, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be glib, we obviously could have raised financing other ways, but, but it was a financing event for us. And look, great companies go public and in great markets, and, and we felt like, you know, we had, we're in a great market and we could be a great company. And so um, that, that is also, frankly, the cheapest way to raise capital. Now, John Back is my good friend in the back who, who brought me back to Washington and offered me a job, and I'll be ever grateful to him for that. Uh, but John won't tell you that, that, that the public markets are the cheapest way to raise money, but with all the complaining about, about the cost to go public, you know, it costs a couple million bucks to go public, it is the cheapest way to raise capital. And, um, and so it's a very efficient uh, market, and you can raise large sums, and, um, and the cost of capital is not too much. So for us, it was, it was a good place to raise capital. Clearly, it raises your profile, as, as, as I've seen here uh, recently, um, but, but I, that's not why we did it. Uh, we did it because we felt like it was, a, it was a great way to raise capital. And listen, I also have venture investors, and, and they invest eventually to get an exit. They've been very patient. They're not in a hurry. They, none of them have ever sold a single share of Eloqua, even to this day. Um, but but uh, going public provides them a path to, to, to having an exit, and so at some point in the future, they'll, they will get an exit. Right, going public, what do you wish you had known before you did it, and uh, can you share one or two sort of war stories in the process? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, um, maybe I, I, I wish I'd known it, but I'm, I'm glad I didn't, is that it's a long process. And um, so, so let me give you a, let me back you up a little bit. I, I think one of the things that I would advise anybody that's thinking about going public, um, and I will offer also, is pick up the phone and call somebody who's done it before you. And, 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 and in particular, anyone in this room that wants to call me, I am happy to share my stories, because it's one of those events that you don't get to do twice. And most CEOs will tell you they like to learn, and, and I like to learn, I learned a ton, and now I don't get to apply any of that learning, because I'm not gonna go public again. So if I can transfer it to you, I am more than happy to do that. And I did that, I, I, I spent a lot of time with people who had just gone public before me, and they're very helpful because the whole process is set up um, to enrich investment bankers and lawyers, and, um, and it's, they're very good at that, it's very effective. The fee structure, how they, you know, how they um, you know, walk you through the process, and they're very, very uh, accustomed to dealing with high ego uh, CEOs and CFOs who don't want to ask a lot of questions because they don't want to seem stupid. And so you want to get your advice from someone that you trust that has been through this before. They can be very, very helpful in the process. Um, one of the things that we did that I, that I would recommend that will surprise you is that we were on file for a year. And that was really, really good for our company because we started acting like a public company um, in August of 2011. What do I mean by that? Um, and this might surprise some of you. We ran our financials um, and we closed our books at exactly the same cadence that we would when we were public. We, we wrote the public press release. We wrote the public script for the, for the investor call. And, um, and we actually used the same system that you use as a public company, the same phone dial-in system and the same computer-based system about who gets to ask questions. We ran our conference calls every quarter for a year just as if we were public. Um, the people that attended were the analysts that were on our business who ended up be, are the same people that attend these conference calls now and our venture investors and our investment bankers. And we ran a faux conference call four quarters in a row. Had you attended my first conference call, you would have said, I'm gonna short that stock as soon as, soon as you go public. Because I, you know, I felt like, hey, I know what I'm talking about. I've been in this business five years. I know the business back and forth. You know, this is gonna be a layup. Yeah, we had a good quarter. I know the stats, da da da. And then you get in that conference call and you get those first tough questions. 
you know, about your deferred revenue. And, you know, if you compare it back 18 months ago, Joe, why didn't this move? And I, my eyes got big and, and I said a bunch of stupid things and my CFO chimed in with a, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it was really embarrassing. It was really, because we were in front of our analysts, we were in front of our investment bankers, but thank God we weren't in front of anybody else. So next quarter came, and we got a lot of, you can imagine how many earfuls I got from my bankers and from my investors. And so the next quarter I studied more and we did better, still not great. The next quarter after that I studied more and did better, still not fantastic. And then our first public company quarter came and everybody asked me like, are you nervous? I'm like, no, we've done this four times before. And I studied and we worked hard and we knew what to say and I learned how to talk like a politician where I can't answer any questions. That's a great question, Jim. Let me answer it a different way, you know? And, and, and it, it is a skill set that as a private company CEO, you're not used to. As a private company CEO, I know all my metrics, I know all my numbers, and I'm glad to tell you all of them. We ran Eloqua in a very transparent fashion, and, um, and you can't do that as a public company. And um, you know, there's great irony in that, but you just can't. And, and so we only give a few metrics out, and, um, and, and so uh, it's just a different process. So I would tell you that, that um, practicing for a year and running our company on a public company cadence for a year was extraordinarily helpful for, for Eloqua. And, um, and, and it's probably made the difference in our post-IPO success. And so um, that, that's, that's one thing. In terms of you know, the road, the, the, when you actually do the process, when you file and you go on the road show, you know, for me, um, the, the, the hardest job in that was it not actually mine. The hardest job was the CFOs. And let me tell you why on a couple fronts. First of all, when you, fill, when you do uh, the S1, it's the most painful process in the world for the CFO. Um, in my company, uh, I, I happen to have a very smart CFO who's take, who took Net2000 public, um, who's been public company CFO twice. And again, that's also part of the process. You know, um, Having a CFO who'd done this before was uh, extraordinarily helpful during the process. And, and Don basically wrote the S1 and his team. And they sat in a room for four weeks with all the bankers. I sat in one session, about 30 minutes into the session, I was pulling what little hair I have left out, and I walked out. And then we made an agreement that I could do some sessions with him, and we would talk about key items, but I could not sit in those sessions where every lawyer is arguing about one word, and should it be this, should it be that, etc. So, so uh, they really built the S1, and then when we went on the road, we kind of swapped roles, which is on the road, I, I did all the speaking, and, and, he, and he sat next to me and nodded his head and then chimed in every once in a while. So the hardest job is the CFOs, because he does all the work up front, and then he has to listen to me talk on the back end, and that was excruciating for him. Because we did you know, 75, 80 one-on-one -on -one meetings where you give the exact same presentation 80 times in 10 days and um, and when you and when you do that and then you, and you do one at lunch etc and when you do that um, this is going to surprise you but uh, but I, I like our business so much that I was okay with that like I can talk about my business all day long and the best parts were the Q&A and people that didn't like our story it's kind of gotten our face those were fun and interesting um, for 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 Don God bless him. He just had to sit there and listen to me talk the whole time. And, and I, I think it was a more challenging uh, process for him than for me. So get a business that is doing well. Get a business that you, you really like. And then the roadshow won't seem so tough when you're talking about it because it's something that, that you have great passion for. Great. So you guys have been public for four months now. Is that right? But, uh, yeah, August. So, right. so aside from being a politician, how, uh, how has your life changed? From a business standpoint. Well, th there's, a, there's about 30% of my time that I have to spend now with investors that, that um, everybody told me I was going to have to do that. And so I said, okay, yeah, 30% of my time. And, and I haven't figured out yet how to make that 30% of 100 instead of 30% of 130. So right now, it's just I haven't learned how to manage that well yet. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. Um, I would say... The part, I don't, the part I like about it is that we have a lot of visibility and that it helps us tell our story and gives us a bigger platform. Um, the part I don't like about it is that um, I start a lot of meetings today with, now, what do you do? 
you know, and explain to me what you do. And so I feel like I'm starting at ground zero a lot of times with investors. And, um, you know, institutional investors invest in a lot of different companies and a lot of different spaces, and so they don't have a lot of knowledge. So, you know, you're three minutes into what you do, and you can see them start drifting at times. And, you know, uh, w what's been fun for me as a private company is my three investors were intimately engaged in our business, um, excited about it, knew it at, at a level of detail that was, was really encouraging. And, and you just don't have that in a public company investment. You know, you just... You're like a politician. You get down to sound bites. You get down to um, comparisons. You try to make it easy for them to invest. And um, you know, and you know, the other thing you do is you focus on quality. Um, we're very fortunate to have Fidelity and T. Rowe Price and Cap Research. They're sort of the three best in public investors that you'd want to have. Wellington. Uh, I'd probably add to that group too. And and so we spend more time with those guys because they really do get deep uh, uh, with the with the with the products. Great. What about your, what are the plans for the next year or two? What are you looking to do with the business? Are you going to go acquire companies? What, what's the, go international? What are some of the things you're going to do with your new capital? Yeah, I got to be careful. I'm not allowed to make forward looking statements. Um, but no, uh, listen, investors didn't give us um, $90 million so that we could leave it in the bank to earn interest. Um, we're not earning a lot of interest right now, as you might imagine. So uh, we're going to go put that money to work. And because our business is a uh, is cash flow break even, and we have been for the last five years, um, you know, I, I had a deal with my board, and the deal was we will invest every dollar we make back into the business. And that was the arrangement we had. They, they said, look, we're not here to get a return when you're small. We're here for you to take every dollar and put it back in. So that's been the way we've run the business for five years, and we're still running the business. You know, ironically, um, this might surprise some of you. Everyone asked me, like, okay, so Joe, talk about being profitable because you're a public company. You've got to be profitable. When I talk to the uh, public company investors, there is more concern that I'm moving to profitability then you know, they want me to spend more money. So most of the public company investors are like, why don't you spend more money? We care more about growth than profits. We don't care if you make profits, we want you to, ha we want you to grow. So in the world that I live in, now this isn't true for everybody, but in the world that I live in, which is emerging market, fast growing SaaS company, growing over 30% a year, they would rather us lose money and grow faster than spend. And um, we call, at Eloqua, we call that the West Coast offense, okay? That's the West Coast offense, right? And so for those of you who've been in the Bay Area, you'll know, and, and we're, we're, our company's pretty big in the Bay Area, and, uh, you know, um, they run the West Coast offense. You know, lose $50 million, and, like, my, I have a competitor, uh, a Marketo, that, that uh, is, a, is a good competitor, and they're helping us grow the market, but um, last year they burned, burned, $50 million on $50 million in revenue. And they are a hero in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and so it's a really interesting dynamic because the public company investing community is also saying, you know, why are you break even? You know, what's the benefit to being break even right now? We want you to grow, grow, grow. So uh, we will spend our money to grow. At Eloqua, um, because it's kind of, we run the East Coast offense, it's, it, you know, we, we, we want to run a disciplined business. Um, we're going to use that money most likely for acquisitions um, to help us bring in tuck-ins and things that can, that can help us grow our business. It's not like us to just go spend money on sales and marketing willy-nilly. It just, we, you know, we, we don't run our business that way. We, we look at things like um, our CAC ratio, which tells us for every invested dollar we spend, you know, what kind of return are we getting on that? And so we're a very analytical company. So really interesting dynamics in, in, in the marketplace today. Interesting. I think we can we have some time for a few questions. I'm sure some of you have some questions for Joe. Um, Lori's going to walk around. Yep. Any questions? Bob Nelson. We, we don't need that. Just uh, regarding Marketo, the West Coast would say, it's better to grow 50% and not be profitable. Is Marketo growing really fast, and that's why Silicon Valley is pushing it? That's right. Yeah, they, they, grew, uh, they grew, last year they grew about 50, 60% last year on smaller numbers. So it's interesting because the incremental growth is less than ours, but because they have smaller numbers, you know, the growth percentage is higher. Uh, 
So yeah, that's what Silicon Valley would say. We like we would rather grow that and burn that kind of money. But again, it's 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 interesting um, when you look at the founder of Eloqua, who's with us today, Steve Woods. He still owns about five percent of the company. Um, all the founders of Marketo are behind over five. Uh, they're, they're behind about 140 million dollars of preference, um, and and so. It's fantastic for the investors in the end. It will be great for the VCs of that company, but the founders and early employees have no meaningful ownership stakes anymore. Because when you burn 50 million a year, guess what you have to do? You have to raise money again and again and again. And guys, that's why it's the West Coast offense, right? The West Coast is run by the venture capitalist team and they, they do great and I'm a big fan of VCs, but you know, don't kid yourself, they're not looking out for their own best interests. And so if you're an entrepreneur, you just gotta balance your need for capital um, and, and with, with, do you wanna own any of the company at the end? You know, and, um, and you might not. And, I, 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 and, and by the way, if you're the CEO, they keep ratcheting you up. So you know, if the, you're the CEO, you raise the money, they make you whole, right? They give you more, so the CEO ends up doing okay. But not everybody else. And so I think the thing that I'm proudest of, you know, is that my my founders um, still own a lot of big, a huge chunk and, and of the company, and they've done very very well. So uh, that that's something that's important to us. Any Anyone other else? Oh, that table. Um, I guess I'm just curious. So uh, in the spirit of reapplying your knowledge, um, if you were you know, to sort of if you were to hi there. Um, if you were to just rerun, uh, rerun your whole process again, like just do over, um, what would you do differently? I make I probably make three big mistakes every day, um, and so um, you know, there's a million things on a on, on a tactical level, million mistakes that we've made. You know, but but I I think the thing about the SaaS business is that we. Um, is that we just build it a little at a time and we try to, we try to make customers happy. In terms of running my, uh, uh, a, a, a couple of th things that jump into mind, like what are the big thorns in my side that I wish I could have done differently? Thorn one, you know, we had an IP infringement lawsuit. We literally had three guys in a garage who came to us and said, you know, you guys copied our product. And we, you know, they were in Indianapolis, we didn't know them. And we had a, they had come to us in 2007 and, uh, and they went and they said that, you know, that, that we copied them, we told them no, we talked to them about it, and they went away. And um, at the time, I didn't bundle up all the data and all the information and all the work we had done in 2007 and stick it in some data vault someplace. And when we filed our IPO, guess who came out of the woodwork? And, um, and you know, they got a law firm to do it on contingency and so they took us all the way to the week before the IPO uh, when we finally settled for three million bucks, which was less than they paid in legal fees. So I, f I felt somewhat vindicated, but I didn't feel good about it. But my mistake as the CEO back in 2007 was that I didn't, I didn't store away all that data like I should have, and some of it we couldn't find five years later. I mean, we're a startup. You know, we had $10 million revenue company, you don't think, you don't think like, oh, we gotta store all these documents and everything, we changed, how many system changes did we have over that time, you know? Um, so lots and lots and lots of examples of, of little things that, that we could have done differently. Obviously, given where we ended up, we, we did a lot of things right um, I, I, and, and got lucky. We were lucky in a lot of ways. You know, one funny story is um, we were lucky that, that when the economy hit bad, um, when it really went bad in 2009, we took our money out of sales and marketing and we put it into R&D. And because we were a subscription business, we still had the money. We, you know, people were paying us every year, so we, pulled f we cut sales and marketing by 40%. And the, the thinking was, we're not gonna sell anything in this economy, and, and that's one of the benefits of being old, and there's not many, um, but that's one of them, which is I had lived through 2000. You, most of you know I was an executive of MicroStrategy in 2000, and, you know, we, and saw the layoffs and you know, lived through all, that, all the pain of that, and then I you know, ran a small company, eGrail, where we cut it in half before we sold it. So those, um, those lessons were really painful, and, uh, and so you know, we were 
prepared when that happened to not believe, hey, we grew 100% the year before, which we had, but we're not gonna grow next year. And so, um, you know, most management teams, particularly in the Valley, um, during that, those times are like, oh, but it won't affect us. And our management team had all lived through it and said, oh my God, let's hunker down. And this time, instead of cutting 5% and then 5% and then 5% and then 5%, we cut 20%. And when I went to my management team and said, we're gonna cut 20%, they, they said, they came back with 21%. No, no lie. They came back with more. Nobody came back with, oh, you know, Joe, we should cut the other guy's department, but not mine. And uh, we ended up cutting sales and marketing 40%, and we put it in R&D. We rewrote our product. We had the oldest, hardest to use, you know, technology in the space because we had started first, and the web had changed in 10 years. And so we re we started rewriting our product. We wrote it here in Washington. I hired a UI team here in Tyson's. Um, they came to me and said, we are gonna write it in this new technology. And I said, uh, I don't think you are. And they said, no, no, it's new. There's only two companies that, that, that are using this technology, but, but it's gonna be really cool, Joe. And I said, we're not gonna do that. I'm not going down some path, but who are the two companies? Apple and Google. So I was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, let's try that. You know, they're pretty smart companies, and they're known for their UI, particularly Apple. So we started writing this technology three and a half years ago. Today, that interface, that, that technology framework is called HTML5. We were so lucky. Um, my engineers today go, oh, we weren't lucky, Joe. We told you that was gonna be big. And I said, if I had a dollar for every engineer who told me a new framework was gonna be big, you know, we got lucky. But we have now the only HTML5 interface in the space. We completely rewrote our technology. We have the newest technology. We have the most customers. So if you look at our market position today, it comes from in a recession, in tough times, making what was very painful decisions at the time. It's not easy to cut 20% of your workforce. We'd never done a layoff. You know, we cut 20% in one day. We treated everybody well. We treated everybody with respect. We all mo moped around and mourned for a month. You know, we're not gonna be what we thought we were gonna be. We thought we were gonna be this great company, but now we're one of those companies that has to lay people off. But, you know, a month and a half later, we had a great quarter and things started to pick up again and we just hunkered down and while the rest of the economy blew up, we rewrote our technology from the ground up. And so I think, I think having seasoned people on your team um, that have lived through difficult times is, is something that I would strongly recommend to everybody because there will be difficult times. You know, and, and we're already making decisions now. As we look into next year, um, we, we're not making stupid decisions. You know, our, our, our competitors are all launching in um, Japan, and they're launching in uh, uh, Western Europe in countries like Spain and Italy and, and France. And my, com my company's like, oh my God, they're in Italy before us. They're in France, you know, what are, you, what are we gonna do? And I'm like, they're just gonna waste money because those economies stink right now and nobody's buying new things. And we're making hard decisions and we're making investments here. And so um, having the courage to, to sort of fend off the, 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 the people that you know, want you to make, make poor decisions, I think it takes a number of good, smart senior executives. And so that's, you know, I wish I could give you a better, all, all the mistakes, I, I could probably spend three hours on all the mistakes because we've made so many of them. Uh, you know, that's the one West Coast play that we run at Eloqua is that failure's okay. It, it, it's okay to have failure. In fact, we, we, we make so many mistakes and it starts with me and I just admit them right up in front. Boy, did we screw that up, you know? And if you give your team the permission to make a lot of mistakes and admit those mistakes and then vector from those mistakes, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's freeing, you know? And, and so I think that's, that's been one of the things that, that we've done well is that we're so good at screwing up and so good at making mistakes that, um, that it's really benefit the growth of our company. So the lesson is failure is good, make mistakes, and you'll get better. And failure is only good if you admit it and adjust. You know, um, That's true. And yeah. so it's, it's not good. Uh, we, look, you, you, know, you don't want to win. I mean, you want to win. We all want to win. Nobody wants to fail. But, but being able to let your organization fail fast is, 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 is really important. Um, and, and, and that's hard. It takes... It takes a big ego, um, and what I mean by that, at, at the CEO level, it, it takes the ability and the support from your board to know that, look, we're gonna tell you all the mistakes we're making, and you're gonna be okay with that. And if you read an Eloqua board deck today, you'd say, oh my God, this is the worst business in the world. Because it, you know, there's seven bullet points on, on page one about all the things we're doing wrong, and all the different parts of our business that are messed up, 
And then the bottom one says, and we hit our number and beat it by 20%. You know, and, but we focus on the things that we do poorly, and we don't kvetch about them. We just try to point them out, identify them, and fix them. And I think that's, that's really, that approach has really helped us be, be good. Great. Well, I think we're out of time. We're going to have a couple of companies come up and present, and, uh, and then we have an investor panel, so hopefully you can stick around. But I want to thank Joe for coming and sharing his thoughts. Thank you.